Hi, today we are going to be doing chapter 13 um, and it is called In the Valley of Loss. So let's go ahead and get started. <clears throat> the mist had cleared from the mountains, the sun was shining, <laughs> and as a consequence, the way seemed much more pleasant and easy than it had for a very long time. The path still led them along the side of the mountain rather than upward. But one day, on turning a corner, they found themselves looking down into a deep valley. To their surprise, their path actually plunged straight down the mountainside toward it. Exactly as at the beginning of the journey when Much Afraid had been led down into Egypt. All three halted and looked at each other. Then, down into the valley and across to the other side. There, the ascent was as steep and even higher than the precipice injury. And they saw that to go down and then ascend again would not only require an immense amount of strength and effort, but also take a very long time. Much afraid stood and stared and at that moment experienced the sharpest and keenest test which she had yet encountered on the journey. Was she to be turned aside once again, but in even more terrible way than ever before? By now they had ascended far higher than ever before. Indeed, if only the path they were following would begin to ascend, they could not doubt that they would soon be at the snow line and approaching the real high places where no enemies could follow and where the healing streams flowed. Now, instead of that, the path was leading them down into a valley as low as the valley of humiliation itself. All the height which they had gained after their long and toilsome journey must now be lost and they would have to begin all over again. Just as though they had never made a start so long ago and endured so many difficulties and tests. As she looked down into the depths of the valley, the heart of Much Afraid went numb. For the first time on her journey, she actually asked herself if her relatives had not been right after all, and if she ought not to have attempted to follow the shepherd. How could one follow a person who asked so much, demanded such impossible things, took away everything? If she went down there, as far as getting to the high places was concerned, she must lose everything she had gained on the journey so far. She would be no nearer receiving the promise than when she started out in the beginning at the Valley of Humiliation. For one black, awful moment, Much Afraid really considered the possibility of following the shepherd no longer, of turning back. She need not go on. There was absolutely no compulsion about it. She had been following this strange path with her two companions as guides simply because it was the shepherd's choice for her. It was not the way which she naturally wanted to go. Now she could make her own choice. Her sorrow and suffering could be ended at once and she could plan her life the way she liked best, not the shepherd. During that awful moment or two, it seemed to Much Afraid that she was actually looking into an abyss of horror, into an existence in which there was no shepherd to follow or to trust or to love. No shepherd at all. Nothing but her own horrible self. Ever after, it seemed that she had looked straight 
down into hell. At the end of that moment, much afraid shrieked. There really is no other word for it. Shepherd, she shrieked. Shepherd, shepherd, help me. Where are you? Don't leave me. Next instant, she was clinging to him, trembling from head to foot and sobbing over and over again. You may do anything, shepherd. You may ask anything. Only don't let me turn back. Oh, my Lord, don't let me leave you. Entreat me not to leave thee, nor to return from following after thee. Then as she continued to cling to him, she sobbed out. If you can deceive me, my Lord, about the promise and the hind's feet and the new name or anything else, you may, indeed you may, only don't let me leave you. Don't let anything turn me back. This path looks so wrong, I could hardly believe it was the right one. And she sobbed bitterly. He lifted her up, supported her by his arm, and with his own hand wiped the tears from her cheeks, then said in his strong, cheery voice, There is no question of your turning back, much afraid. No one, not even your own shrinking heart, can pluck you out of my hand. Don't you remember what I told you before? This delay is not unto death, but for the glory of God. You haven't forgotten already, have you, the lesson you've been learning? It is no less true now that what I do thou knowest not now, but thou shalt know hereafter. My sheep hear my voice, and they follow me. It is perfectly safe for you to go on this way, even though it looks so wrong. And now I give you another promise. Thine ears shall hear a word behind thee saying, This is the way, walk ye in it, when you turn to the right hand or to the left. He paused a moment, and she still leaned against him, speechless with thankfulness and relief at his presence. Then he went on. Will you bear this too, much afraid? Will you allow yourself to lose or to be deprived of all that you have gained on this journey to the high places? Will you go down this path of forgiveness into the valley of loss just because it is the way I have chosen for you? Will you still trust and still love me? She was still clinging to him and now repeated with all her heart the words of another woman who had been tested long ago. Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest, I will go. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God, my God. She paused and faltered a moment, and then went on in a whisper. And where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Ruth 1, 16 and 17. So another altar was built at the top of the descent into the valley of loss, and another stone added to those in the bag she still carried, after that, they began the downward journey. And as they went, she heard her two guides singing softly. And the song they sang went, O whither is thy beloved gone, thou fairest among women? Where dost thou think he's turned aside, that we may seek him with thee? The shepherd himself sang the next verse, and it said, He is gone down into his garden, to the beds of spices sweet, for he feeds among the lilies, tis there we are wont to meet. Then much afraid herself, seeing the last two verses, and her heart was so full of joy that even her unmelodious voice seemed changed and sounded as sweet as the others. 
her song went. So I went down into the garden, the valley of buds and fruits, to see if the pomegranates budded, to look at the vine stock shoots. And my soul in a burst of rapture, or ever I was aware, sped swifter than chariot horses, for lo, he was waiting there. Considering how steep it was, the descent down into the valley seemed surprisingly easy, but perhaps that was because much afraid desired with her whole will to make it in a way which would satisfy and please the shepherd. The awful glimpse down into the abyss of an existence without him had so staggered and appalled her heart that she felt she could never be quite the same again. However, it had opened her eyes to the fact that right down in the depths of her own heart, she really had but one passionate desire, not for the things which the shepherd had promised, but for the shepherd himself. All she wanted was to be allowed to follow him forever. Other desires might clamor strongly and fiercely nearer the surface of her nature, but she knew now that down in the core of her own being, she was so shaped that nothing could fit, fill, or satisfy her heart but he himself. Nothing else really matters, she said to herself, only to love him and to do what he tells me. I don't know quite why it should be so, but it is. All the time it is suffering to love and sorrow to love, but it is lovely to love him in spite of this. And if I should cease to do so, I should cease to exist. So, as had been said, they reached the valley very quickly. The next surprising thing was that, though the valley did seem at first a little like a prison with the strong bracing air of the mountains, it turned out to be a wonderfully beautiful and peaceful place. Very green, with flowers covering the fields and the banks of the river which flowed quietly through it. Strangely enough, down there in the Valley of Loss, Much Afraid felt more rested, more peaceful, and more content than anywhere else on her journey. It seemed, too, that her two companions also underwent a strange transformation. They still held her hands, but there was neither suffering nor sorrow in their touch. It was as though they walked close beside her and went hand in hand simply for friendship's sake and for the joy of being together. Also, they sang continually, sometimes in a language quite different from the one which she had learned from them. But when she asked the meaning of the words, they only smiled and shook their heads. This is one of the many songs which all three sang down in the Valley of Loss, and it was another from the collection in the old songbook, which Much Afraid so loved. And it said, I am my beloved's and he is mine, and this is his desire, that with his beauty I may shine in radiant attire. And this will be when all of me is pruned and purged with fire. Come, my beloved, let us go forth to the waiting field, and where thy choicest fruit trees grow, thy pruning knife now wield, that at thy will, and though thy skill, their richest store may yield, and spices give a sweet perfume, and vines show tender shoots, and all my trees burst forth, burst forth in bloom, fair buds from bitter roots. There will not I my love deny, but yield thy pleasant fruits." It is true that when Much Afraid looked at the mountains on the other side of the valley, she wondered how they would ever manage to ascend them, but she found herself content to wait restfully and to wander in the valley as long as the shepherd chose. One thing in particular comforted her. After the hardness and slipperiness of the way on the mountains where she had stumbled and limped so painfully, she found that those quiet green fields she could actually walk without stumbling and could not feel her wounds and scars or stiffness at all. All this seemed a little strange because, of course, she was in the Valley of Loss. 
Also, apparently, she was farther from the high places than ever before. She asked the shepherd about it one day, for the loveliest part of all was that he often walked with them when they were down there, saying with a beautiful smile that it was one of his favorite haunts. In answer to her question, he said, I am glad that you are learning to appreciate the valley too, but I think it was the altar which you built at the top, much afraid, which made it so easy for you. This also rather puzzled her too, for she said, but I have noticed that after the other altars which you told me to build, the way has generally gotten harder and more testing than before. Again he smiled, but only remarked quietly that the important things about altars was that they made possibilities of apparent impossibilities, and that it was nice that on this occasion it had brought her peace and not a great struggle. She noticed that he looked at her keenly and rather strangely as he spoke. And though there was a beautiful gentleness in his look, there was also something else which she had seen before, but still did not understand. She thought it held a mixture of two things. Not exactly pity, no, that was the wrong word, but a look of wonderful compassion together with unflinching determination. When she realized that, she thought of some words which one of the shepherd's servants had spoke down in the valley of humiliation before the shepherd had ever called her to the high places. He said, Love is beautiful, but it is also terrible. Terrible in its determination to allow nothing blemished or unworthy to remain in the beloved. When she remembered this, much afraid thought with a little shiver in her heart, he will never be content until he makes me what he is determined I ought to be. And because she was still much afraid and not yet ready to change her name, she added with a pang of fear, I wonder what he plans to do next and if it will hurt very much indeed. And that is the end of chapter 13. I hope you have a great night. Thank you.